I'm Rick Bushnell, and I'm here today with Joe Guastella. Uh, this session is going to deal with oysters in Barnegat Bay Estuary. Now, although our name is Reclam the Bay, uh, we've been working with oysters almost as long as we have clams. We started back in 2005. So today, we're going to start with a video trailer. It's a great little film that um, that's called The Oyster Farmers, and it was produced by Angela Anderson and Corinne Ruff. Uh, and it explains some of the oyster farming culture that includes commercial and the ecological value. Uh, and then after that trailer, we're going to learn a little bit more about what Reclaim the Bay does when they grow oysters from larvae and then where we use them to stabilize shoreline. So with that, uh, I'm going to get started. When was the last time you guys were out the bay at six in the morning? Barnegat Bay was a source of seed oysters for areas from Long Island down to Delaware Bay. When we go back and look in the middle 1800s, the amount of oysters that were consumed is just phenomenal. Barnegat Bay historically had 12,000 acres of oyster reef habitat, but the fact is, is most of that habitat is gone. You're looking at a body of water that's compromised. People don't understand the ecological significance of the demise of the oyster. Oyster reefs are like coral reefs. They're a critical habitat for thousands of species. There's water quality issues. There's a lack of oysters in the bay. There's an excess of phytoplankton. There's a million and one reasons why we need an oyster reef in the bay. The real question is, how do we do it? By choosing New Jersey to grow in, we've taken it upon ourselves to try to convince people that it's a great place to grow oysters. You know, it's a vibrant, sustainable industry. I like to think that the golden age of oysters is before us and not behind us. Despite my dad's best efforts of not wanting me to make a life on the bay, I wouldn't want to do anything else. It's where we live, it's where we eat, where we grow, it's what we do. I love it out here. The bay brought people to the area. It's long been forgotten, and I think people need to be reminded that towns are here because of the bay. So, with that as a backdrop, um, take it away, Joe. All right, well, you've heard the, uh, the people in the trailer speak about oyster population decline, which is a serious problem. But really the bigger problem is that the oyster reef is a living ecosystem. So it affects not just the oysters themselves. Oysters basically are indicators of what's happening in the bay. Uh, if the bay is healthy and fish are joining in, we are also not having just clean water, we are, we are supporting our commercial fishing industry and our tremendous New Jersey recreation industry where people come down to visit uh, at the shore. A slide right here of Barnegat Bay, but it's really not just Barnegat Bay. There are three bays which comprise what we know historically as Barnegat Bay. To the north is Barnegat Bay, uh, to the central portion, which is uh, generally in the area of the Causeway Bridge, which goes over to LBI, that's called Manahawken Bay. And the southern portion of our bay is Little Egg Harbor Bay, which goes all the way down to Tuckerton and then to the Beach Haven Inlet. Here's how oysters fit into the equation of Barnegat Bay. Uh, one acre of oyster reef. And you heard in the slide that historically, Barnegat Bay had up to 12,000 acres of oyster reef alive and healthy. One acre of oyster reef can provide habitat for fish, predators, crabs, snails, worms, shellfish, and other seafood. About 1.5 tons of fish and seafood. Uh, at 12,000 acres, we're talking about a lot of seafood that can be thriving within the area of an oyster reef. So that's why we want them around. Oysters also clean the water and they clean the water simply by feeding. They're filter feeders 
This means that they pump water right through their body and they remove algae and other micronutrients. They also remove sediment and pollutants and they return the water to the bay clearer and cleaner than it was. One single oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water per day. Wow. Um, and I, th I think you had uh, told me one time about a calculation of um, how long it would have taken in the old days to, to clean all the water in the bay. Back in the day, when there were uh, approximately 12,000 acres of oyster reef in it, the oyster population could filter the entire volume of water in Barnegat Bay within a period of 24 to 72 hours. So it's just like an extraordinary fact. Wow. And, and then I know that there are some other services that they provide uh, the Bay and working with some of the organizations like Mordecai Island uh, Land Trust. They come up with all sorts of benefits of, uh, of living shorelines. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about that, but just while we're on that topic, um, one of the things that, um, that this chart shows us is that uh, a marsh and oyster reef act as a natural barrier to waves and just 15 feet of marsh can, observe 50 per, can absorb 50% of the incoming wave energy. So that's, that really knocks off a lot of the problems that we saw with Sandy. And then the, the other thing is that uh, a square mile of salt marsh stores carbon in the equivalent of 76,000 gallons of gasoline, and that's annually. So just to uh, add a, a little more dimension to that number, 76,000 gallons of gasoline is about the equivalent of what 100 average cars would use in the course of a year. So yeah, there are a lot of, a lot of good things that, uh, that living shorelines and oysters can provide, but let's go back to you, uh, to your talk. All right, so we're, we're looking at Mordecai Island over here. Mordecai Island is just off the bay coast, off the, off the eastern bay coast of Barnegat Bay, uh, right, up, right off Beach Haven on LBI. And the, this island is an important nesting site. Uh, birds, migratory birds, terrapins, uh, and in addition to being a marshland and absorbing the energy that Rick was talking about, this island, however, has been experiencing shoreline erosion from wave action, and it's been slowly disappearing for decades. So our organization, Reclaim the Bay, has been partnering with the Mordecai Island Land Trust, as well as other organizations, New Jersey Department of uh, Environmental Protection, Stockton University, Army Corps of Engineers, to study and protect the shoreline, and this is as an important natural resource. But we'll talk more about that in a little while. So, so we know now that they do some really wonderful things, and I think we'll have some pictures of those. And in fact, I think we'll have a whole other session on living shorelines. But let's talk now, or if you would, share with us how uh, Reclaim the Bay actually grows the, uh, the oysters that they then uh, use in living shorelines. Yeah, let's start with a little bit of information. We're going to be hearing terms like spat on shell. Spat are basically baby oysters. They grow and that reef will grow and oysters generation after generation will continue to grow in the same spot and adhere themselves in one particular place acting as a natural barrier. Uh, and we, we try to do that remotely. We'll show you how in just a little bit. So Spat on shell is what we is what we uh, what we use in Reclaim the Bay to grow oysters in a tank. Uh, you can see that finger pointing to a little dark spot uh, on a clamshell. And as I said, oysters like to grow on shell. The uh, that 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 spot is actually an oyster, and it's an oyster that's adhered itself right to the shell, as as many of them will do. You can see that shell is part of a mesh bag filled with shells. And this is how we do it. We put these shells in a tank. Uh, they attach themselves to a shell by secreting a glue. It's, once it's attached, it stays there for life. That tiny bag in the man's hand contain approximately 2.5 million oyster larvae. Uh, we purchased them from a facility such as the Aquaculture Innovation Center in Cape May. Uh, this, this is a research center which breed and study 
clams and oysters and other shellfish, they also breed disease resistant varieties of oysters and clams, which is very important because as I mentioned earlier, uh, disease has decimated the oyster population in the bay down to a, less than 5% of what it once was. So they'll, anyway, they'll take these male and female oysters and they put them in, in tanks. The females release their eggs and the males release their sperm. The resulting larvae, when they're, when they're fertilized, they're collected, they're fed, and they're grown to a size in, in, in their own development stage that, that they can be sold and they're ready to set. Um, that is an eyed larvae. The reason why it's called an eyed larvae is basically because it looks kind of like an eye, uh, that dark spot that's in the center of it. And the oyster at this point is also growing its own shell. Now, when they're larvae, they swim freely, but as the shell grows, they get heavier and they tend to sink. So that's what's called the oyster set. They get, they get so heavy from putting on their shell that then they're going to sink to the bottom and they're going to set on whatever. And then they've got that glue that you were talking about the whole yeah. Whatever hard surface they can connect to, they'll, they'll uh, yeah, well, that's not, that's not like a, a refreshing cocktail in the middle of a summer, summer afternoon that uh, the man who's holding that jar is Jim Dugan from the Mordecai Land Trust. And he is looking at a glass of oyster larvae. Um, he wants to make sure that they're healthy and they're active before he adds them gently and carefully to a tank filled with bay water and bags of shell. Uh, at which point they're going to be fed microalgae, hand fed by volunteers for a period of maybe up to seven days, while we hope that they will be setting and adhering themselves to the shells in the bags that we have, uh, thus becoming spat on shell. Here's a, uh, another photo of that bag with oyster larvae being dumped into a bucket of bay water. I shouldn't say dumped because they have to be handled very gently. They have to be acclimated to the temperature. They're very sensitive to temperature at this stage and we want to keep it within a certain range. So first they're acclimated to the water that came from the tank. So the earlier slide was a picture of, um, of Jim making sure that they were healthy and happy and swimming around. So then in this one, then we're just releasing that almost looks like a cloud that's very, very fine. So that's released into the bucket and then the bucket is going to be used to, uh, yep, there it is, to, uh, to put the larvae into the tank. And those are the shell bags in the bottom? Yeah, the shell bags are in the bottom. The tank is filled with water from the bay. The water from the bay has it, slightly filtered. We, we attempt to keep it as clean as possible. Uh, we need to keep the temperature between 77 and 82 degrees. So depending upon what time of year it is, we might have to turn on a heater. Uh, we also have a bubbler in the bottom of the tank, which keeps the larvae from sinking to the bottom and attaching to the bottom of the tank instead, instead of to one of our shell bags. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, during this same period, we have to feed these animals by hand because we're not pumping in any bay water, which would contain their normal nutrients and microalgae. So it's a long process, it's quite involved. So then this is a clip of Jack showing the bubbling action, one thing or another, in the tank. So the larvae, actually, we should be told, have been in the tank now for a week. Uh, we had them in the tank with the water turned off for three days. Then we put them back on again. We put the flow back on again. And they're too small right now to see. But by next Friday, with week today, we should be able to tell what our spat looks like. Uh, here's an empty tank. This is after the shell bags have been removed, after they've set on the shell. As a matter of fact, photo is a picture of, uh, of a clam shell with one, two, three, at least four oysters which have set on it. That's a wonderful thing and that's what we want to see. But if you look at the picture of the empty tank, you can also see there have been oysters which set on the tank itself. It's unavoidable. Can't do anything about it. But if we can get a good set of oysters onto a shell like that, well, then when we put them out in the bay, we cross our fingers and know that they'll have a decent chance of survival. Uh, we're going to show you some more examples of oysters that these tiny little, little dark spots are oysters. They're, 
They're like the like the size of a grain of rice, as a matter of fact. And we're going to see a few more of them coming up. So that's after about a week. And the, the first one was uh, was right after they set. And then we got this one. Yeah. And then they begin to grow. This is a couple of weeks later. Uh, shows a, a pretty good example of how the oysters grow and they spread. And they stay there. And they will continue to grow on top of each other. Well, I guess uh, I guess you and the guys are kind of proud of that then, aren't you? Yeah, we sure are. And you can hear Marty to uh, give you a little bit of uh, information on how we do that and how proud we are. All right. Good morning. Here at Reclam the Bay, we've taken all our bags of shells, which have oyster spat on them. That's what they look like. They started out as microscopic larvae, and now they're growing. Mm -hmm. And eventually they'll go out into the bay and create an oyster reef. So what are those things in the tank? They're look like Legos or something? Yeah, they do look like giant Legos. They are called oyster castles. They're inter interlocking blocks, just like a Lego set would be interlocking. And they're, they're made from a mixture of concrete and calcium and crushed up oyster shell, which as it turns out through research, proves to be very attractive for oysters to set and grow on. Uh, these these castles are are brought out into the bay. Uh, we started them in our tank, and you can see that we have bumps on them. Those are oysters fat, which are growing on the castles themselves. Those here, the photo on the right, shows them uh, later on in the summer, and photo in the center actually shows that same oyster castle a year later, so the oysters are getting bigger and healthy and they continue to grow. Uh, we put about 50 oysters into our tank, that's all we could fit, but the entire structure of that oyster castle, which was constructed off the coast of Mordecai Island, contained about 1,500 blocks. And it's really a, a labor-intensive operation. Uh, they had to be brought out by barge and put in by hand. So it's, it's, it's a big deal to get an oyster castle out there. Oh, so now we're back to that part about, uh, about filling the bags. Yeah, for, for our purposes at Reclaim the Bay, we don't usually have access to barges and to uh, the heavy equipment, which can help us to load oyster castles. So we use shells in bag, uh, clam shell, oyster shell or whelk shell. In any event, the, the bags that we're filling up over here are used not only to grow oysters in our tank, or the spat and shell, but we also use them and pile them in certain areas to act as a physical barrier to break down the impact of the waves coming in and reduce the shock uh, in vulnerable areas. Uh, here's, a, here's a pile of, of that shell which has been delivered right from La Monica Seafood in Millville, New Jersey. That pile of shell cost $700. The entire load, which averages about 20 to 23 cubic yards of shell uh, into our location in Beach Haven. Uh, yeah, and that, that, that pile of shell would wind up making about a thousand bags. Uh, here's uh, after we've bagged it up, that's what it looks like. Those bags are ready to be loaded up onto boats and transported to their destination out in the bay. And then uh, this is pretty clever. Uh, the way that you guys load the uh, load the boats. That so that's the, the shell bags that you're using a an old water slide, I guess, to, to take them down into the uh, take them down into the boat. Yeah, slide them right down into the boat. And then this looks like the guys uh, ready to go out and uh, and uh, and take those shell bags out to the uh, to the staging area on on Mordecai Island. Yeah, yeah, they're going to give us a little tour of Mordecai Island. I guess. Well, this has been great, Joe. I really appreciate you taking the time to tell us about all this. And I guess the uh, the next video that we want to do will be showing how the shell bags are placed and all the good work that they do. All right, that sounds fine, Rick. Thanks for the opportunity. This is uh, more than anything else, as far as I'm concerned. This is a lot of fun.